Awareness is what gives me choice, and my choices are what can create my freedom, right? If it's true that we can become more aware, mindset plus skill set plus action set needs to be aligned, right? Would you agree that becoming a millionaire or a multimillionaire is an effect? Having a net worth of a million dollars or earning a million dollars a year, that's an effect right? Effect, right? Your health is an effect of what you eat or don't eat, how you sleep, what exercise you do. Yes, your metabolism. But when we're looking at money, how much net worth you have and how much income you have every day, every week, every month, every year, it's an effect. Are you aware that you and I have these automatic negative thoughts or automatic positive thoughts based on what has been conditioned in our subconscious mind from birth, from what we were taught by our parents, our teachers, our experiences, and the meaning we gave things? Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because in my first business, I was making 300 bucks a month. I quit on my business partner and the thing that saved me was studying the stories of super successful entrepreneurs. So I hope that this story today helps give you the motivation you need because I still need it to myself. So today, let's learn from one of the best, John Asaraf and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Is it possible that in order for you and I to develop a millionaire mindset, first we need to discuss, determine, be aware of the automatic negative thoughts versus the automatic positive thoughts. Here is some research that was done several years ago around automatic negative thoughts and automatic positive thoughts because here's what, what, what happens. When we have an automatic negative thought, okay, we have uh, basically a nine to one ratio, nine negative thoughts to every one positive thoughts on average. Nine to one, why? Well, we have something called the right prefrontal cortex in our brain. And whenever we're thinking about achieving something really great, we wanna double our income. We wanna make more money this month. We wanna pay off our debt. We wanna be financial free. We wanna become a millionaire. Do you know what the right prefrontal cortex, this part of your brain does? It automatically looks in your memory bank, right, in your subconscious memory bank, and it, says, what if you fail? What if you're embarrassed? What if you're ashamed? What if you're, what if you're ridiculed? What if you're judged? What if you're disappointed? And this part of our brain is responsible to keep us safe and in our comfort zone, why? Because we avoid pain and we avoid discomfort more than we move towards pleasure. Let me repeat, pay close attention. We as a species, will do more to avoid pain and discomfort than we do to gain pleasure, okay, and reward. So average expedition, failing in our brain can be a win because it's protecting us, protecting us from being disappointed, protecting us from being embarrassed, ashamed, ridiculed, just protecting us from dealing with our family, protecting us from looking in the mirror saying, you see, you knew you wouldn't succeed. So. What do you think we need to do? And this is where I start with all of my students. The first thing is we have to become aware of the thoughts. The first thing we want to be aware of is thoughts. Okay, we're not born with any thoughts. We're not born with any beliefs. We're not born with any habits. We're not born with any negative fears or empowering thoughts, right? We're not born with any of those. We develop these patterns in our brain and guess what our subconscious mind does? Imagine that you have um, bubbles that percolate up from your subconscious mind. Imagine 6,200 bubbles a day are percolating from your subconscious mind. 6,200 thoughts is how many we have a day. If 90% of those, okay, if 90% of those are negative, that's about 5,500 negative thoughts a day, and let's say about 700 or 600 or so are positive thoughts. Do you know what we are responsible for? To be aware of the thoughts, to let go of the disempowering ones and to focus on the positives. Rule number two, shift your focus. Have you ever heard of the saying, energy flows to where attention goes? 
energy flows to where attention goes. So what does that really mean? We are all made up of energy, right? We have uh, water in our bodies. We have blood flowing in our body. But are you aware that whatever it is that you are focusing on, your attention, uh, especially in your brain, that's where the energy flows, the blood flows? So let me explain. Let's say you have a problem that you are uh, worried about. Uh, it's causing anxiety, it's causing stress, it's causing uncertainty. The part of your brain that can actually help you solve that problem, which is your left prefrontal cortex, or what I call is the Einstein part of your brain, energy or blood flow will actually move away, you know, from that part of your brain, you know, to that fear center of your brain, the uncertainty center of your brain, the part of your brain that is the fight, flight, or freeze part of your brain, otherwise known as your sympathetic nervous system. And so when you're in a state of focusing on your doubts, your, your worries, your uh, things that aren't working in your life, things that you're upset about, things that you're angry about, things that you can't figure out what to do, have you ever considered that the more you worry, the more you worry, the more you give energy to what it is that you really don't like or don't want to feel uh, or don't want to do, you actually are reinforcing the very thing you don't want that you would wish would go away. So stuff doesn't just go away, but you can guide it away. And so the question is, how do you restore energy flow back to that genius left prefrontal cortex, Einstein part of your brain that I like to call it? And a simple inner size is whenever you're feeling stress, anxiety, doubt, worry, or any of the disempowering feelings and emotions, have you ever just thought about stopping, being aware, calming yourself down instead of exciting you into the worry? One of the easiest way to do that is something that um, you did from the second you were born. Your breath, right? Your breath in through your nose. Slowly, 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 slowly. out through your mouth, slowly, slowly, slowly. And I like to breathe out through my mouth like I'm breathing out through a straw so I can focus my attention here versus allowing my brain to run rampant with thoughts. So one more time. As soon as you or I take six, seven, eight deep breaths, slowly in through our nose, out through our mouth, we actually deactivate that doubt, stress, worry, anxiety center in our brain. And we shift from the reactive stress mode into a calm, responsive mode. Sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic nervous system. Those are your two systems. And in this calm, responsive state, responsive meaning I can respond now instead of automatically react, I can now ask what's causing me to have so many doubts? What's causing my worry? Does it make sense to worry? Is worrying an emotion that I really want to engage in? Worry is a prayer for what you don't want. Let me repeat, worrying is a prayer for what you don't want. So in a state of doubt and worry, uh, we perpetuate more doubt and worry. In a state of calmness, we can actually be more proactive and responsive to say what's causing my anxiety, my doubt, my worry, my fears, my uncertainty. And then if we asked another question, it says, what can I do right now 
to relieve the doubt, stress, worry, anxiety? What can I do? Who can I call? What help do I need? In those empowered questions lays the answer to releasing some of the debilitating, destructive emotions, fears that you may not want to have, that may not serve you. And so just remember, you have the most powerful tool in the known universe to work with, your brain. That is like simple inner size number one that you can do anytime you're not feeling totally the way you want to feel, all right? Practice your breathing. It's yours. There's many different types of breathing inner sizes you can do, but why not get used to doing the first one, the easiest one first? Rule number three, learn to adapt. Crazy time in the world right now. So much uncertainty, unpredictability, chaos, confusion, lots of stuff that's happening right now that none of us have ever been a part of. Stuff like it, yeah, World War II, uh, some recessions, sure, but never anything like this with so many different competing uh, threats, so many different competing things to be thinking about that uh, affect your life every day, your business, your career, your family, your health, uh, lots of stuff going on. And still, um, we have got about you know three months left in the year, 2020. Before you know it, Thanksgiving, before you know that, Christmas time, before you know it, New Year's Eve, and you're gonna look back at this year. And the question I want you to be in did you make the most out of this year? Did you adapt? Did you shift? Did you adjust? Did you surrender to what is, accept what is, release what you needed to release, accept what you needed to accept so that you can be focused, in control, on purpose, on target, no matter what? The number one greatest skill for this year has been adaptability, adjustment, tweaking adjustment. So. Uh, about three months left in 2020. What are you going to do to make sure that your health is better than it is right now, that your finances are better than they are right now, that your relationship is better than it is right now, that your career or business is better than it is right now? And the reason I want you to focus on making it better is because where your attention goes, energy flows. Let me repeat, where your attention goes, energy flows. So if your attention is on, oh my God, what's happening? What am I gonna do about it? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I can't? What if I don't? What if I, listen, what if you do? What if you focus your energy and attention on how to make everything better right now? What will you do differently today, tomorrow, this week, next week? What will you do differently is what's gonna make the difference. More of the same equals more of the same. So I want you to recalibrate your focus, recalibrate your attention, recalibrate your intention, and then I want you to start some planning. Behavior equals results, and it's the behavior you take or the behavior you don't take. Either one is a behavior. You have more control than you think you do. You have more abilities than you think you do. And I know that with focused attention and follow through, right? Follow through, you can have a great next 90 days. The question is, are you committed to a great next 90 days? I am looking for me, my team, uh, my private clients, you to finish the year off strong and to start next year fast and strong. And that's gonna take some thinking, some planning, and execution. The discipline to follow through to completion. Are you in for the challenge? Rule number four, know your priorities. When I was a younger entrepreneur, I didn't really know anything about time management. And I later came out to find that there is no such thing as time management. And I'll explain in just a second. I'll come back to that. 
So here I am looking at this bill from my lawyer. His name was Don Gardner. And I'm on the phone with him. And I'm telling him, what in the world is this bill for $1,800 for? I didn't use up $1,800 of your time. He says, of course you did. He said, let me send you some evidence that you did use $1,800 of my time. So he sends me this information and I take a look at the document that he sends me and it has everything marked out in 15 minute increments. And I'm looking at this and I'm reviewing everything that's on this document and I recall talking to him about that stuff, but I didn't know that he was charging me for every single discussion that I had with him. And so I said to him, I said, Don, what the hell is this? You know, we talked about this, I get that, but like, I didn't know that you're charging me for every 15 minutes. And here is what he said to me. He said, as a lawyer, I sell my time and my expertise and my knowledge and my contacts. And if I don't keep track of my time in 15 minute increments, he said, clients like you, meaning me, take advantage of it because they don't remember all the things that they are asking me for. Now, that's not what the lesson was. The lesson in here was this, because he was keeping track of what he did every 15 minutes, he could determine who his best clients were. He could determine where to put energy, time, and focus. And because he kept track of what he did, he also was able to keep track of when he wasn't making his highest income per hour. And so I'm gonna ask you a question. Do you know what your highest income producing activity is? Do you know that there's no such thing as time management? The only thing you can manage is what you do in time. So let's say you work 10 hours a day like I do. I'm an entrepreneur, you're an entrepreneur. Do you know which activities pay you the most? So I'm fortunate, I get paid a lot of money per hour. $5,000 per hour when I'm consulting, $50,000 for a one hour keynote. And that means that if I don't know what my hourly activity is, I may be missing out on opportunities. And so I divide my time into two types of blocks. One is what I call my highest income producing activities. And so I have a list of when I get paid the most amount of money and how many hours a week I want to um, uh, focus on my highest income producing activities. So me doing this video, for example, because I love video, I love to share, I love to give value to people. This is a high impact activity. I'm not making any money doing this video, but it's a high impact activity because I can share it with the world, which is one of my you know, um, highest values of contribution. So I divide high income and high impact activities into chunks of time, whether it's 15 minute chunks or 30 minute chunks or one hour chunks of time. And I know that I want to invest, let's say, 10 hours a week on high impact activities, things that give me the most purpose, the most meaning, things that allow me to make high income activities possible as well. So if I'm working, for example, with my team on an idea for a product, uh, an idea for marketing, an idea for a series we wanna create, that is a high impact activity, meaning that activity is gonna have a high impact somehow. And so I want you to do this little exercise. I want you to write down everything you do. Don, my lawyer, had a list of everything that he did every single day. And he actually gave me this sheet that he used to track every 15 minutes. And then guess what I did? 
I tracked every 15 minutes to see what I was doing. And you know what? I was wasting so much time on what I call are the trivial many versus the critical few. If you want to have a little fun, take out your calendar wherever you keep all of your appointments and look at your calendar and see how many hours were you working on high income producing activities, meaning that the activity produced income. Whether you were selling in front of an audience, whether you, you, know, you were making a sale on the phone, that's a high impact activity. Or when you were preparing to create something that you need in order to make money, that's a high impact activity. And I want you to rate them A1 for high income or high impact, A2 and A3 for anything less than that. And just start to be aware of where are you investing your time, your energy and your attention. Here's what I guarantee you you're gonna notice. You may be active, but you may not be productive. You may be doing a lot of stuff, but it may not be the things that are gonna really move your business to where you want it to go. So are you up for a challenge? If you're up for a challenge, the next 24 hours to 48 hours, write down everything you do in 15 minute increments and just be aware of where you are trading your time because time is your greatest asset. Of course, knowledge and skills are great, but time, what are you doing in time will determine whether you're gonna move your business forward or whether you're just going to be busy. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business i'll see you there rule number five just keep going you know what one of the hardest things of being in the personal development industry as an author uh, as a teacher as somebody that some people look to for guidance and support and wisdom the hardest thing is days that I just don't feel like doing what is needed that day, that hour, that you know, morning. So I've come up with uh, a little mental game that I play with myself. And whether I'm tired, whether you know, I'm just not up to it, for whatever reason, I just don't feel like it. I do a couple things. Number one is I ask myself, why is it that I set out to do, whether it's my you know, daily inner sizes, my visualization, my meditation, my mindfulness practice. Why did I start doing it? And the answer, you know, in that particular case, is to reinforce the neural patterns, to strengthen my mindset, knowing that habits create my behavior, and my behavior creates my results. And then I ask myself, you know, whose life is impacted, or whose lives are impacted, by me following my daily rituals or habits or the behaviors that I know are gonna help me achieve my goals and dreams. And so I think through all the people that depend on me to uh, apply all the stuff that I'm teaching. So I'm not just teaching it, but they can see me applying it and they can see the results of it. And then I ask myself this one last question, and what's the cost of me not doing it? And whenever I think about that last question, uh, obviously going from two positive questions you know, to this one challenging question, I think of um, the price I'd have to pay is that I don't reinforce a neural pattern that is gonna empower me. Um, I let myself down in taking action. I may let other people down if I don't follow through. Now, listen, uh, every once in a while it's okay to uh, not feel like it and then not do what you need to do every once in a while. But if you do that too often, then 
your identity shifts to somebody who does that too often and that becomes part of your story and your identity and then all of your behaviors line up with somebody who doesn't follow through and do what she or he uh, says they're going to do. So I came up with this one little technique. It's called the law of just a little and I just made that up. The law of just a little. So whenever I don't feel like working out, like today for example, it's a day I just didn't feel like it. I just do a little bit. And so I went into my home gym and I rode the bike, uh, recumbent bike, I don't know, for 15 minutes at an easy, easy pace. And then I did some bicep curls, ah, really, really lightweight. And I did a little bit of stretching, um, very, very gently. And I was only gonna go in for like five minutes. I ended up being in there for like 25 minutes. And what does that do? when you actually don't feel like it, don't want to, you hear the self-talk that's disempowering, you feel the emotions of, ah, you know what I'm talking about. And then you go and do it. Well, then you reinforce that you are the character that can override the I don't feel like it muscle. You develop the identity of doing a little bit when you don't feel like it. You reinforce the positive pattern versus a negative pattern. You develop the willpower to override emotional power. So there's a lot of benefits to doing a little bit when you don't feel like doing any. And one of the things that I teach all of my students is this, pay close attention, the habit is more important than the intensity. The habit is more important than the intensity or the duration. And so when you want to reinforce a positive, constructive, empowering habit, even a little bit of a positive reinforcement through behavior, through thoughts, through emotional connection to it, is better than not doing it unless it's your rest day, it's your off day, because those are important as well. So just think about when you don't feel like reading, you know, uh, a chapter in a book, read one paragraph. When you don't feel like exercising, do one minute. When you don't feel like making a sales call or two or three or four, you know, upgrade your skill on how to be better at that. There are positive behaviors that we can take that reinforce and empower us versus disempower us, deconstruct the positive patterns. Rule number six, be intentional. If you have a goal that is motivating you, is your motive for action, and it is bigger than your motive for inaction. Did you hear that? You have to have a motive for action that's bigger than your motive for inaction, okay? And when we're talking about that, when we're talking about a motive for action, okay, we also want to do a couple things. I'm gonna give you four things that you need to do. You're gonna have a goal. You're gonna have a timeline for when you're going to achieve the goal by, all right, why? Because if we have a goal that is important to us and we have a timeline, we're invoking not only Pareto's principle but Parkinson's law, which says, ready, Parkinson's law says, that I will get done what needs to get done in the timeline that I give myself to get it done by. I will get done, Parkinson's law, what I need to get done in the timeline that I give myself to get it done by. So when we have a goal that we want to achieve that's bigger than the reason for us to be lazy or to procrastinate, and we give ourselves a timeline, we actually activate a little bit of that stress center in the brain and the motivational center in the brain. Does that make sense? We want a little bit of stress. Why? Because that stress releases cortisol, a stress hormone, but cortisol is like a little bit of rocket fuel. So when we have a little bit of cortisol and a little bit of the dopamine in the anticipation of taking action, that actually opens up the motivational center and that's connected to the behavioral center. Did you hear me? Your brain's made up of networks and circuits. When we are being lazy, when we procrastinate, the motivational circuit is turned off. The behavioral circuit is turned off. So what we wanna do is deliberately turn it back on. Does that make sense? Either the lazy circuit's on or the motivational circuit's on. Those two circuits are not on at the same time. 
You can't be lazy and motivated and actually do work. You can be lazy and motivated, but if your reason, if your reason to stay lazy is bigger than your reason to achieve your goals, you will not follow through with action. Rule number seven, set realistic goals. As you well, well, well are aware, there's the setting goal part, and we use our imagination and our deductive reasoning. I want this or that, not this, not that. Pretty easy, right? But what do you do when you're uncertain, when you have either some self-doubt or you're lacking the knowledge or the skills to achieve the goals that you want? What do you do when that brings up some fear and some uncertainty that causes you to maybe procrastinate or not take action? So there's a couple things that you can do. One is set a goal that you know how to achieve. And so I'll give you just a little example. Uh, I haven't been able to run in years due to some injuries. And so I recently set a weight goal that uh, I knew I could achieve, but I also knew that you know jogging and doing some higher intensity aerobic exercise would be what I need. And so what I did is I set a small little goal to be able to jog one mile in less than 15 minutes. Now, I could walk a mile in 15 minutes, but I decided just to get going so that I could create a little mini plan for Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays to be able to just get out there and start. So it was a realistic goal that even though I haven't been running for a while, I knew I could achieve it and all I had to do was get going. That was the only real decision, just to get going. Jog very, very slowly to get it done. Now, today I finished my third day this week of doing this jog. Now, what I love to think about when I'm jogging, for example, is as I'm getting tired and I feel like quitting, I just pick a spot, maybe, you know, 100 feet in front of me, and I just say to myself, just get there. And then once I get there, I see how do I feel? I say, well, just get a little bit further. And I call this fractional goal achievement. I reduce it to ridiculous um, expectations, ridiculously low expectations, so that I reduce the resistance in my brain of going, oh, I don't want to, I want to quit, I want to stop, or I don't want to start. So when you're setting any goals for yourself, if you're not used to setting goals or you've set goals before and maybe you haven't achieved them, that's okay. You're human, you're normal. It's just part of the process. What I want you to do is set a realistic goal for maybe just one week from now and set up one or two or three doable action items that you then follow through on no matter what. Even if it's a little bit, you do it no matter what. Now, why do you wanna do that? Well, first you wanna break any patterns of inactivity or of mental or emotional resistance. And when you just take a little bit of action, where maybe in the past you haven't, and when you push yourself just a little bit, where maybe in the past you haven't, you start to build your neuro muscles of self-confidence, of trust, of self-respect. And those three things are required in order to achieve your goals. So realistic goal setting and realistic goal achievement go hand in hand. And when you reduce the resistance, you're more likely to take action, all right? So that's realistic goal setting and goal achieving. If you wanna stretch a little bit, then what's a goal that scares you just a little bit? Just a little bit outside of your current comfort zone and see if you could reach that. And what I always like to do is break things down into uh, one or two or three behaviors, action steps that move you towards that uh, goal achievement. Move you towards, so what is it for you? You pick the goal, what's one thing that I can do? That's the question you ask yourself. What's one thing I can do that'll push me outside of my comfort zone? And what happens is just like a rubber band, when you pull a rubber band, you know, when you pull it, you know, it goes back to its normal state, then you pull it again, it goes back to its normal state, you pull it again, it goes back to its normal state. After a while, the band stretches. 
you're stretching your mind by challenging yourself a little bit. You're stretching your emotional control by challenging yourself a little bit. And you're challenging your behavioral habits to stretch beyond their comfort zone. And as you stretch your comfort zone, you become more, you're capable of more, and you achieve more. So reduce it to the ridiculous, do it, develop that habit, and I promise you, you will start achieving more and more of your goals and dreams. Rule number eight, build the right mindset. I don't even have my cell phone, which I'm gonna go outside right now. And I was left with nothing other than what I had in my head, my knowledge, my skills. And I looked at my bank account, there was no money there. And it was just the most bizarre feeling, almost like a little nightmare. And then something dawned on me. What dawned on me was that I didn't need any money. I didn't need any clothes. I didn't need any tools. All I needed was to tap into what I've got in here. 59 years of knowledge and skill building, 59 years of successes and failures, 59 years of figuring out how to make it work. And so here's what I'm gonna ask you if you're a business owner. Do you have the right mindset to be dropped off anywhere in the world with nothing, no money, no phone, maybe just access to a computer? And could you, in less than a year or two, make enough money to thrive? Could you get out of debt? Could you make the thing happen? Now, here's why I ask you this. When you lose everything, which fortunately I've never had to do, but when you lose everything, you realize one thing. If you've got the mindset of what you need to do, how you need to think, how to manage your emotions, and you have the skill set to, for example, grow a business, generate leads, brand your business, create messaging that people are gonna resonate with, create sales processes, you know, that you can take people through a logical and emotional ride to be able to get more clients and make more money. You realize that all of the confidence, all of the self-worth, all of the things that you need are already within you. But if you don't have that, that's what's gonna cause the lack of self um, discipline, that's what's gonna cause procrastination, that's what's gonna cause self-sabotage, that's what's gonna cause uncertainty. So, here is your trick. You want to achieve more success in your life? Focus every day on your mindset. Focus every day on upgrading your skill set so it matches the vision and the goals you wanna achieve. And focus every day on the three highest income producing activities that you should do and the three highest impact producing activities and guess what will happen? You will be able to start from zero or below zero, and you'll be able to achieve the financial, business, life success that you want to achieve. Rule number nine, visualize your future self. Very few people think about the fact that we are repeating the same patterns in many cases of our parents or even of our own lives from the time we were you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Well, what if you can go to the future and you can think about if I could change my story today that would get me to the future that I want, what would the story say? And in the book, I've given you some inner sizes and some exercises to start writing out your story. Now, you may think, what do you mean write out my story? I learned many years ago to write out my money story, my life story, my relationship story. And I've always started um, in this fashion. I am so happy and grateful for the fact that I am living the life of my dreams and I am traveling all over the world uh, first class and I um, am able to give to the charities that my wife and I and children love and I'm able to, and I write down in present tense Everything that I'm doing, feeling, experiencing for health, wealth, relationships, career, business, finances, fun, experiences, charity. I write down a page or two pages that is a story that I want my future to be like. And then I type it out because I usually write by hand. I type it out and then I laminate it. Then I'll record it and then I'll listen to it over and over and over again. Now you may think, that sounds silly, why would you do that? Why? 
because any information that you get in through the senses, through your ears, through your eyes, that you touch, that you feel, activates neurons in the brain. When those neurons are activated and they wire together, if you repeat it often enough, your brain says, hey, you're investing a lot of time and energy on this stuff. Uh, let me start to put some automatic processes to make that story real. And this is where winning from the inside out comes to play. This is why using meditation and visualization and mindfulness and affirmations and emotional, man emotional management techniques and subliminal programming all work. If you can get the information into the brain and you have spaced repetition backed with emotion, you are gonna develop the neural patterns that will activate something called automaticity, all right? Or automaticity is when these neurons activate automatically and then your perspective changes, your beliefs start to change, your behavior starts to change. The filters by which you see the world and the lens by which you see the world start to match up with the story. One of the first things we do in our Way in the Game of Money program is we help people program a new money story so they can then earn the money they want and live the life of their dreams. Why? Because it works. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is slow down. There are three key things that I would tell my younger self if I could take the knowledge and the wisdom that I've accumulated in 40 years of building companies. If I could take that wisdom and go back in time 20 or 30 years, lesson number one would be this. Slow down and create plans. Let me explain. When I was younger, I would take every single day as a challenge to get as many things as I could done. However, I didn't take the time to really focus on the things that were gonna make the biggest impact in my business. I gave everything the same value. And so, yes, I was busy, yes, I was getting things done, but if I could go back in time, I would focus on what is the plan that's gonna move me down the road to achieve the business success that I want faster and easier versus, versus harder and more complex. And now, as I am almost gonna be 60, I think about time. And I've done some videos in the past on there's no such thing as time management. All you can do is manage what you do in time. But in order to know what you should do in time, you have to think about what are the objectives that you want to achieve in your business. And in business, there's obviously sales, marketing, finance, management, product development, technology, etc. But there are certain things that you need to do before you do the other things. And what I've discovered is we tend to gravitate towards the things that interest us and are easy for us to do. But business isn't like that. In business, there are critical things that you have to do if you're serious about building a business that actually works for you instead of you working for it. So one of the things that is really, really important is that you take the time to find out what are the building blocks for your type of business, whether you're online or offline. The second thing that I would do, and I would give my younger self the instruction to do, would be to get myself into a mastermind group with people who are also working on the things that I need to get better at. Now, I don't have a mastermind group to sell you or offer you, so don't worry about that. But what this really means is there are people out there that are building their businesses as well, trying to figure out the same things you're trying to figure out. Why do it alone? Doing it alone is the slowest path to business growth. And if you can get yourself into a mastermind group with people who are better than you in other areas, then you can level up your knowledge and your skills 
in order to be able to implement what it is that will work instead of trying to figure out on your own. It takes so many hours to figure out what you need to do. It's like solving a Rubik's cube. If you don't know which way to move the Rubik's cube, you can spend thousands of years trying to figure out. The third thing that I would make sure that I did back then was pay myself first. Let me explain. When I first started Remax of Indiana, even though money was coming into the company, I wasn't taking any money out. And I worked for, for months and years on end, you know, just putting everything back in the business. And that created a lot of stress in the early years. And so what I would do differently now is I would value myself more and I would take an income or take a percentage of the revenues on an ongoing basis so that I got paid for the services that I provided to my business. Now, when you put yourself up on the pedestal where you deserve and you pay yourself, you actually build your self-confidence, you build your self-worth, you build your self-esteem, and you get paid for the services rendered. When you pay everybody else first, you are putting everybody else in front of you. And you are the number one person that you need to keep motivated. And it doesn't matter how much it is that you pay yourself. It has to be something for the effort and the work that you do. So at least you build your own self-worth and value. So those three things, if I can go back to my younger self, I take more time to plan. I would make sure that I paid myself first. I would make sure that I get into a mastermind group where I could learn with other people what to do. That'll help you be motivated. It'll build your self-confidence. It'll build your self-worth. And more importantly, it'll make sure that you are doing the right things and that you are productive instead of you being active. Every one of us has got commitments, uh, whether it's commitments to our family, our friends, our children, our boss, our employees, our parents, our siblings. We all have so many commitments in every area of our lives. Health, wealth, relationships, career, business, fun, experiences, charity. And how are we supposed to manage all of it? And the answer is very carefully. One of the only ways that I have learned how to manage the complexities of life is to compartmentalize the different areas of life and to set up a process of prioritization based on the highest values and the uh, doing the things that have to get done before any of the other things. Now, the reason I bring this up is uh, Harry, who I just had uh, lunch with, as I mentioned, he was sharing with me that one of the things that helped him last year was that I gave him this framework to be able to manage some of the complexities that were happening in his very, very uh, successful and busy life. And the framework I gave him was to take each area of his life and either create, you know, a sheet of paper that he can write on, uh, a whiteboard that he can write on, or even on your computer, and ask yourself, in the area of your, whether it's spiritual health, what is one thing that you can do, if that's important to you, every day or every week to make sure that you can get that done? In the area of your emotional health and well-being, what's one thing that you want to get done? In the area of your mindset, what's one thing you can get done? In the area of your physical body, what's one thing that you can get done either every day or every week or every month, depending on what it is that you want to achieve? And then you do the exact same thing for your business. There aren't 500 different things that you and I have to do. When we focus on the one thing in each area of our life and we get that one thing done, then we're making progress. We're moving the needle down the field. Now, in some areas of your life, of course, there's gonna be two or three things, but when you get it out of your head, 
and onto something that you can look at, you get rid of the neural overwhelm and the emotional um, anxiety that comes by having so many things that you're trying to think through in your brain. So most people I've found, they don't take any time to plan their health, wealth, relationships, career, business, and they have no order to what they need to do, what they must do, and by when. And so when you structure your, uh, your behaviors from highest importance to lowest, you'll see that some of the lowest imp things that need to get done aren't the most impactful. They're not the ones that move the needle. Now, it just takes a little bit of time to sit, to sit, to stop what you're doing, sit, think a little bit, create some lists for health, wealth, relationship, career, business, fun and experiences, and charity. There's your seven categories. And then itemize the stuff that you want to get done. Give yourself the gift of discipline. Give yourself the gift of structure. Give yourself the gift of thinking before you act and then tweak and adjust on a daily or weekly basis. And I promise you, you will become so much more effective. You'll reduce your stress. You'll reduce your anxiety. You'll increase your productivity. And chances are you're going to increase being happier and achieve more of your goals. Over the last couple of weeks, as I've been in a lot of self-reflection mode, reviewing what worked in 2019, what didn't, and why, um, and as I looked at the person in the mirror who is responsible for what worked and what didn't, here's what I can share with you were a few of the key distinctions and lessons for me. Number one is details matter. The goals that I had in 2019 where I was really clear on the outcome and the specifics of how I was going to achieve it. And I built into my calendar the review process to see whether I'm on track or off track and to determine why. When I looked at the results that I achieved, every single goal that I achieved was backed by the strategies, the tactics, the timelines, the tools, and the resources to achieve that goal. And every single goal that I didn't achieve did not have the strategies, the tactics, the timelines, the tools, and resources to achieve it. So what does that tell me that I can impart and share with you? Number one, a goal without a clear plan is really not enough to make it happen. And so what I've been doing for the last two weeks for my own personal goals, for the goals with my wife, for the goals with my team for Neurogym, is we have been breaking down every goal that we are committed to achieving, not that we want to achieve, that we are committed to achieving, and we are drilling down with exactly how we're going to achieve it. And here's what is really critical. I have a theme and that's around slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Let me explain. I tend to go fast. Let's go, come on, let's go, go, come on, come on, come on, come on. And for some things that works and for other things, it just doesn't work. And so I am gonna be working on, focusing on, slowing down to get all the plans, systems, processes in place so that we can actually pick up speed instead of let's go and figure it out along the way. So for you, why not maybe adopt you know, my theme for at least a month, slow down to pick up speed and take every one of your goals for this quarter and slow down enough to ask yourself, how am I going to achieve that goal? Whether it's a health goal, relationship goal, career goal, business goal, financial goal, how are you going to do it? And come up with your plan. And it doesn't matter if your plan is 
you know, simple or complex, but come up with your plan and then take that plan and put it into your calendar and then work your plan every day, every week, every month, every quarter and then adjust on a regular basis. Many of you know that I take about 15 to 20 minutes every morning to look at my plan for the day, my appointments for the day, the outcomes for the day. I take about 20 to 30 minutes every Sunday night to review my week and to plan the following week. I take about two to three hours every month to review the month, and then I take a day every quarter to review the quarter. Why? Well, imagine that we were on a, you know, on a boat on the water over there. We were going from here in San Diego. Let's say we were going to the South Pacific Islands. We'd pick our destination and then we would check. Are we on track or are we off track on a regular basis? And maybe there's a GPS system on the boat that tells us, you know, you're, you're heading in the right direction or you're not heading in the right direction and making some auto corrections. But there's also the, uh, the captain, right, making adjustments based on the, the wind, the temperature of the water, the, the waves, etc. So why not become the captain of your own ship with your destination, the points you're going to achieve along the way, and a bunch of points in between to check and balance, check and balance, check and balance, check and balance. The more frequently you check and balance, are you on track or off track, doing the right things or not, the more you can predict whether you're gonna achieve your goals and dreams. First and foremost, you know, I like to deal with reality of what is going on and what is the truth first and foremost. Now, let me ask you a question. Would you agree that times of uncertainty, times maybe of fear for some people, times of stress for some people, is also a time for us to learn how to adapt? Isn't adaptation one of the greatest skills, okay, that we as humans can learn? And many years ago when I was in the Galapagos Islands, I bought a hat. And if you have ever been to the Galapagos, you'll know that it's like going back 5 million years. And there's a saying there, and I got this hat, it says adapt or die. Why? Because the survival of the fittest, okay, the whole idea of survival of the fittest is based on Darwin's work. And we actually retraced his trail with, uh, with the Beagle when he was writing about the survival of the fittest and learning about adaptation is the animals that learned to adapt were the ones that survived. The ones that got to survive obviously multiplied. So here is my question for you, okay? We are sometimes the most advanced species on earth. Uh, most intelligent, and I'm going to say sometimes, right? What are you doing to adapt right now? What are you doing to adapt right now? What are you doing to adapt mentally? What are you doing to adapt emotionally? What are you doing to adapt physically? What are you doing to adapt spiritually? What are you doing to adapt financially, right? Those are the five places of adaptation, right? So spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially. So what are you doing, okay, to adapt, Right? What are you doing to adapt? When there are things happening in our environment, whose responsibility is it to adapt? Right? So let me share something with you. If it's true that adaptation is a skill, right? If it's true that, you know, as a human species, we have the ability to adapt, let me give you a couple of things that may help. Okay? And I like that. Praying, yeah. Um, share with me, you know, what you're doing. Divergent, I guess you didn't like my comments because you're still here, right? So share with me, how do you manage? Let's start with number one. How do you manage your mindset to go from being reactive to being responsive? Is that something that every one of us can do? When we're reacting, it's usually without any thought, right? It's usually without any thought. When we're responding, it's usually because of thought, right? And I don't mean just thoughts, I mean thinking. So the way I like to do it is say, here's what's happening, whether it's, you know, interest rates, uh, the market crashing, COVID, monkeypox, uh, the Texas shooting, which please, you know, let's say some prayers to all of the families, all of the families, 
um, you know, that are going through this nightmare right now. Uh, but what can we do, what you and I can do to respond instead of react, right? So naturally, depending on the situation, we may react in anger. Um, and that's, that's a part of our fight flight response, right? We're going to act out of anger and blame and shame and guilt. Um, that's right. But we may act in a state of fear, right? Fear is a protective state since the number one priority of our brain is to avoid any you know, pain or discomfort, but also to uh, make sure that anything that is happening around us right, um, is managed for survival and safety. Survival and safety. Every one of us is 100% self-disciplined already to our current thought patterns, emotional patterns, and behavioral patterns, which obviously are responsible for our results. So my question for you today is this. Do you have the right disciplines? Do you have the right disciplines to set goals, create plans, and achieve them? Do you have the right disciplines to prime your brain with your vision, your goals, and your plans for the day every day? Do you have the right discipline to review your day at the end of the day to see what did you do well? What could be tweaked so that tomorrow is even better? Do you take time on Sunday nights for maybe 30 or 40 minutes to plan your week so that you're not reacting to stuff, but you're planned? you're organized, you're in action that's deliberate versus reactive. That's another discipline. Do you take time every month to review your month? Do you take time every quarter to review your quarter? Do you take time at the end of each year to review the whole year and then to plan your vision for the next year, your goals for the next year? Now, these little disciplines are what I call keystone disciplines or keystone behaviors and habits that set you up for success. And so I like to consistently ask myself, do I have the right keystone habits? The, the big things, you know, that swing, the little hinges that swing the big doors. So a couple things I can tell you that really work for me is taking the time to think to plan, to um, review my results, and in a state of no blaming myself, no shaming myself, no feeling guilty, no justifying, no wishing I wish it was different or better or this or that, just in a pure state of awareness, I tweak and adjust and tweak and adjust and tweak and adjust and tweak and adjust. And here's what happens. What you'll discover is you're gonna be on course a lot of the time you're gonna be off course some of the time. But when you take the time to recognize if your thoughts are aligned with your vision and your goals, are your emotions, your, your things that cause you to take action or not aligned with your vision and goals? Are the behaviors that you're taking aligned with achieving those goals? Now, when you're in a constant state of review, tweak, adjust, behave, review, tweak, adjust, behave, that is a self-disciplined action and habit that will lead you to achieve every one of your health, wealth, relationships, career, business, charitable, every goal you have. The how to achieve the goal is the easiest part. Getting yourself to take the inspired action because you have a big reason why you must is really what you need to work on because we all are gonna have challenges. We're gonna have failures. We're gonna have days we feel like on top of the world and other days we feel like, oh man, I just don't even feel like getting out of bed. That's okay, that's normal, that's called being human. But if you have the self-discipline to get up and do a little bit, to get up and adjust and tweak, then you win the game more than you lose the game. Uh, think about athletics for just a moment. To make it into the Hall of Fame, for, exact, for example, in baseball, you will not hit three out of 10 balls. You will not hit them. You will not get on base. That means you're failing, so to speak, seven out of 10 times. But to make it to the Hall of Fame, the best of the best, all you need to do is 
hit, get on base three times. So a lot of people have a misunderstanding of success and that is that you succeed every single minute, every single hour, every single day. And that's not just not true, right? Uh, the most successful people in the world are consistently taking action, making sure that it's the right action. If it's not, they adjust. So have the self-discipline to not blame, shame, justify, or make yourself feel guilty. Have the self-discipline to create the plans, take inspired action, manage your thoughts, get into the right state, the physiology, the feelings that you need in order to achieve your goals and dreams. Take inspired action daily. And don't focus on perfection, focus on a little bit of progress every single day. The number one factor for how you choose a good mentor um, is not whether somebody is nice to you and somebody likes you and somebody, you know, uh, cuddles you and makes you just feel lovey-dovey, warm and fuzzy. A good mentor, okay, pay close attention to this. Should a good mentor tell you what you want to hear or what you need to hear? What should a good mentor or coach tell you? What you want to hear or what you need to hear regardless of how hard it might be. What should a good mentor give you? What you want to hear or what you need to hear? And I think you all know the answer. A good mentor, his or her job is to share with you what you need to hear, to kick you in the butt a little bit sometimes, to get you off of being stuck. And so the way you choose a good mentor, right, is First, you find somebody who's actually achieving or has achieved recently. That's critical. Somebody who is achieving or has recently achieved what you want to achieve. Why do I say that? Have to choose a mentor or coach for the times that you are in right now. Does that make sense? So don't find a mentor, for example, who lost weight 25 years ago, okay, that's overweight now. Don't choose a mentor who had a great business 10 years ago, but doesn't understand the nuances of business today. Don't choose a mentor that's in a lousy relationship now, but had a good one before. So if you want to choose a good mentor, Choose somebody who has the knowledge and has the skills for the time and who will tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Does that make sense? So that's an extra little, little pointer. The second thing that is really important is, you know, you can see the ocean, you know, right back there. And a lot of people are busy, you know, working, acting, doing, 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 doing. But the question that you always have to ask yourself is, is there a difference between activity and productivity? Do you think there's an activity, there's a difference between activity, being busy and productivity? Are there people or times in your life where you're busy, 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 but you're not making a lot of progress? Are you ever caught in that cycle of do, 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 but you're really not making that much progress? Is that a yes or a yes, right? So what does a good mentor or coach share with you? One of the things that they do is they give you direction. Go in this direction, not that one or that one. Right, so in addition to the knowledge and skills, they point you in the right direction so you actually get to your destination, whether it's health goal, relationship goal, career goal, business goal, money goal, get out of debt goal, health goal. They help you get the right direction so that all of the work that you're doing has an effect that's net positive versus net negative. I cannot tell you how many people I come across that when I ask them, like, what's your goal? They tell me the goal. What's your vision? They tell me the vision. And I say, you know, what is your plan? What are you doing every single day? I can't believe how much time people waste doing the wrong things, working hard. Do you get that? Doing the wrong things, working hard. So it's really important to have the direction. All right. So that's number two. So the number three. Okay, number three uh, reason to have a mentor and a coach 
this is something I've needed my whole life. A lot of people see my life and they go, oh wow, you've got this and you've got that and you're healthy and you're happy and you're... What most people don't see is the times, you know, when I've been down, with the times that I've failed, the times that I was uncertain, the times that I was dejected, the times that I wasn't achieving my goals. Do you know what my mentors did for me? They lifted me up when I was down. They lifted me up when I was down. I'm not a religious person, but I remember this beautiful little story uh, in, uh, in a newspaper column called Dear Abby. And there was this man that was angry at God. And he was angry at God. And he, he says to God, he says, Hey, God, why is it that, you know, during the best times of my life, you know, I always saw two sets of footprints in the sand. All during the good times, I only saw two sets of footprints, mine and yours. And then in the most horrific times of my life, I only saw one set of footprints. Why did you leave me? And God said to the man, says, the footprints that you saw was me carrying you through the difficult times. That changed this man's perspective, of course. Like I said, I'm not religious, but the story leads itself to what does a good mentor or coach do with you. It's not just put extra wind in your sails when times are good. It's to be able to give you perspective, right? It's the ability to give you the lift when you need to be brought out of your doubt, worry, failures, challenges. So that also comes into, will your mentor and coach be there to lift you up or carry you when you need it to support you? You know, will you be in the environment, okay, that will be able to lift you up when you are down? Here's what I can promise you. If you are going after your goals and dreams, okay, life is complex. Let's not make any, you know, qualms about that. When you're going to go after your life's goals and dreams, uh, you're going to succeed. You're going to fail. Uh, you're going to be positive. You're going to be negative. You're going to be up. You're going to be down. A good mentor and an environment will help pick you up when you're down. So the support is critical. The hardest thing is days that I just don't feel like doing what is needed that day, that hour, that, you know, morning. So I've come up with a little mental game that I play with myself. And whether I'm tired, whether, you know, I'm just not up to it for whatever reason, I just don't feel like it. I do a couple things. Number one is I ask myself, why is it that I set out to do, whether it's my you know, daily inner sizes, my visualization, my meditation, my mindfulness practice, why did I start doing it? And the answer, you know, in that particular case, is to reinforce the neural patterns, to strengthen my mindset, knowing that habits create my behavior, and my behavior creates my results. And then I ask myself, you know, whose life is impacted, or whose lives are impacted, by me following my daily rituals or habits or the behaviors that I know are gonna help me achieve my goals and dreams. And so I think through all the people that depend on me to uh, apply all the stuff that I'm teaching. So I'm not just teaching it, but they can see me applying it. They can see the results of it. And then I ask myself this one last question, and what's the cost of me not doing it? And whenever I think about that last question, uh, obviously going from two positive questions, you know, to this one challenging question, I think of um, the price I'd have to pay is that I don't reinforce a neural pattern that is going to empower me. Um, I let myself down in taking action. I may let other people down if I don't follow through. Now, listen, uh, every once in a while it's okay to... Uh, not feel like it and then not do what you need to do every once in a while. But if you do that too often, then your identity shifts to somebody who does that too often and that becomes part of your story and your identity and then all of your behaviors line up with somebody who doesn't follow through and do what she or he uh, says they're going to do. So I came up with this one little technique. It's called the law of just a little, and I just made that up. The law of just a little. So whenever I don't feel like working out, like today, for example, it's a day I just didn't feel like it. I just do a little bit. 
And so I went into my home gym and I rode the bike, um, recumbent bike, I don't know, for 15 minutes at an easy, easy pace. And then I did some bicep curls, ah, really, really lightweight. And I did a little bit of stretching um, very, very gently. And I was only going to go in for like five minutes. I ended up being in there for like 25 minutes. And what does that do when you actually don't feel like it, don't want to? You hear the self-talk that's disempowering. You feel the emotions of, ah, you know what I'm talking about. And then you go and do it. Well, then you reinforce that you are the character that can override the I don't feel like it muscle. You develop the identity of doing a little bit when you don't feel like it. You reinforce the positive pattern versus a negative pattern. You develop the willpower to override emotional power. So there's a lot of benefits to doing a little bit when you don't feel like doing any. And one of the things that I teach all of my students is this, pay close attention. The habit is more important than the intensity. The habit is more important than the intensity or the duration. And so when you want to reinforce a positive, constructive, empowering habit, even a little bit of a positive reinforcement through behavior, through thoughts, through emotional connection to it, is better than not doing it. Unless it's your rest day, it's your off day, because those are important as well. So just think about when you don't feel like reading, you know, chapter in a book, read one paragraph. When you don't feel like exercising, do one minute. When you don't feel like making a sales call or two or three or four, you know, upgrade your skill on how to be better at that. There are positive behaviors that we can take that reinforce and empower us versus disempower us, deconstruct the positive patterns. We may be wired with limiting beliefs. We may be wired with low self-esteem. We may be wired to fear failure or fear disappointing ourselves again or fear getting up and speaking uh, because when we were a kid, we got up and kids made fun of us that we gave the wrong answer. We can now rewire our brain to have more confidence, more certainty, more empowering beliefs, to let go of stupid fears that hold us back because of something we did in childhood or because of something that our parents said or a friend said or a brother or sister said to embarrass us or make us feel ashamed of ourselves. So the greatest discovery, the science of neuroplasticity, shows that the neurons, the brain cells that fire together, wire together. And the neurons that we fire deliberately, that wire together, and we do that over days and months and weeks, we can literally rewire our brain to earn more money, rewire our brain to release the self-image of being overweight, rewire our brain to be more confident, more certain, uh, and, and that is an incredible gift that we have. We don't have to settle for what is. We don't have to settle for our, uh, our present circumstances. We don't have to settle uh, for a life of stress and anxiety and uncertainty. What we can settle for is our unlimited potential. What we can settle for is the ability for us to reinvent ourselves, to reinvest in ourselves, to deliberately and consciously evolve ourself by thinking the thoughts that we want to think, by feeling the emotions we want to feel, by behaving in ways that match the success that we want. And if we do that for a week, for a month, for two months, for three months, we deliberately break free of the old patterns and create new ones and reinforce those. Is it possible that then our brain goes to work for us and it deletes or distorts all the old that holds us back and it starts to help us create the most amazing life that we want. If we understand fear, is it possible for us to use fear as fuel? Is it possible for us to use our fear, okay, as power to actually take action instead of it controlling us? Let me ask you a question. This is, I love going deeper, as you all know, around the neuroscience of what's happening. Were you born with any fear? Were you born with a fear of failure? 
Were you born with uh, a fear of losing out? Were you born with a fear of being embarrassed or ashamed or ridiculed or judged? Were you born with a fear of dis disappointing yourself or your loved ones? Uh, and the answer is we weren't born with it. We were not born with uh, any fear. So that means that we learned what to be fearful of, right? Now, is it possible that what causes you to have fear may not cause me to feel fear? Is it possible that we all have a different meaning, right? The meaning that we learned to give something creates the feeling. The meaning creates the feeling. So if we're thinking about how our brain operates, right? We have an idea. I want to become a coach. I want to start a business or I want to grow a business. I want to leave a relationship I'm not happy in and hopefully find another one. I want to ask for a raise. I want whatever. Is it not true that as soon as, you know, we either have this idea of what we want, our brain is processing, is there any potential danger there? Is there any potential emotional risk where I'm not going to feel good? Is there any physical danger there? So when we understand, okay, that fear is nothing more than a signal based on past memories and the meanings that we learned to give those things, then we say, huh, is it possible that the meaning that I have at a subconscious level, the meaning that I have at a subconscious level is probably triggering my fear because my brain's trying to keep me safe. My brain's trying to keep me in my comfort zone. My brain is doing what? Is job. My brain is doing its job. So when that fear circuit is activated, is it true that the neurochemical release, right? The, the neurochemicals, whether it's cortisol, it's a neurochemical, epinephrine, a neurochemical, norepinephrine, neurochemical, right? Same one, adrenaline. These are the amp up neurochemicals, right? When we're in a state of, um, uh, of calmness, when we're in a state of love, when we're in a state of, you know, togetherness, Chances are we're releasing, you know, maybe oxytocin, maybe serotonin, maybe a little dopamine, neurochemicals. So we have certain neurochemicals where we can be calm to respond and love and motivated. And we have these other neurochemicals that are more of the amped up fuel chemicals for what? Our ability to fight, our ability to freeze just to stay still, to protect ourselves, our ability to do what, right? So it's fight, flight, run away. Fight, flight, run away to get away from the danger. And so what happens, right, is how do we turn the fear into the fuel? How do we turn the fear into the power, right? And so the first thing we have to understand is we first have to be aware of when it is that we are fighting, freezing, fainting, fawning, right? We have to be aware of when we are activating the fear signal. Now, a fear signal can be as a result of something that's happening in the physical world. So we, we're walking down the street, we're about to walk off the sidewalk and a car comes and we hear the sound of the car and so we jump back up okay, onto the pavement. That's a good fear reaction, fear reaction, right? If somebody attacks us, that's a good fear reaction. But for most things that we want to achieve, our brain is just sending us a signal that there may be danger here. So I want you to think about this. What is going to be bigger? your desire to achieve your goals, okay, or the risk of being embarrassed. It dawned on me that sometimes we don't have the right frames when we're doing something and we don't um, give things the right meanings. And let me explain what I mean to you by that. 
When we uh, start something new, I think sometimes we forget that anything that is new to our brain uh, may be exciting and uh, may release dopamine, the re neurochemical that uh, you know is the reward neurochemical, and uh, we feel good because we've taken on this new endeavor. Whether it's a new language, whether it's retraining our brain, uh, whether it's um, starting to exercise or eating better or committing to doing something that's of benefit to us or even stopping something. Now, the very nature of how our brain works is that patterns that have been repeated over you know months and years are the dominant patterns in our brain. And therefore, it's easier for our brain to activate and follow through to completion on those patterns. It's like having a, you know, a highway system that's been built. It's easy for the cars to go faster on the highway system. Well, the same thing is true with our brain and the neural networks and pathways. So the uh, pathways are the easiest for the um, chemicals to travel across um, and release the um, neurochemicals, you know, that make us feel good or make us feel fearful or make us feel apprehensive or doubtful, etc., uh, are the ones that are the easiest for our brain to activate and follow through on. Okay, part one. So that means that a new pattern, meaning stopping something or starting something, requires a little bit more of the brain's energy and the brain wants to conserve energy. So what is our brain naturally going to do? And the answer is, uh, it's going to resist. Why? Because it wants to preserve the energy that may be required in case there's a saber-toothed tiger that comes around from, you know, the, the woods to try and kill you. So we're in this energy conservation um, uh, mindset without even knowing it. Uh, our biology is geared towards doing things that are easy for us, not things that require energy, right? Glucose. So why am I sharing this with you? Well, as you're, you know, on your journey of brain training, upgrading your knowledge and skills, taking actions, probably different actions than you were taking to achieve the results that you want more and better results from, uh, of, um, it requires you uh, accessing higher cortical functions and a higher level of awareness, especially, pay close attention, especially when you feel resistance. Now, I came out here, I still have my workout gloves on because as I was doing uh, some ab work, as I was doing you know, some um, bench press and flies for my chest, one of the things that dawned on me is most people do things that they're comfortable doing, but in order to get stronger from a cardiovascular perspective, you have to challenge yourself. Mix up your routines. You've got to go a little bit longer, a little bit harder. Um, uh, you know, on the days that you want to expand your capabilities. So, in the world of uh, you know doing weights for strength training or building muscle, there are certain techniques uh, to use and certain strategies to use, including rest. Right? Uh, muscles build built in the rest phase. So, let me explain what I'm talking about. I think you know where I'm going with this. When I, let's say, do a bench press or a fly or I walk up a hill, the place where it's the hardest, where there's resistance, where I want to quit and stop and I'm breathing heavier, I just can't do another rep, that's the point of the growth. And the more you practice at that place, right, the resistance, the point of I want to quit, I can't do it anymore, that is how you expand your capacity. Resistance happens when you're at the edges of your capacity. Now, it could be mental edges, emotional edges, physical edges, financial edges. And how does it show up? It shows up as stress, right? Stress. So stress happens when your current capacity, let me repeat, Stress happens when your current capacity exceeds the demand. Your current capacity exceeds the demand. So how do you increase demand? I'm sorry, how do you increase capacity? Well, you feel the edges and go one more. You feel the tension and keep doing it. You feel the desire to quit 
but then you do as much as you can. And as you do as much as you can, you get mentally stronger, physically stronger, emotionally stronger. So when I feel like, let's say, quitting, I just say just a little bit more. When I don't feel like it, I say, I know, but just do a little bit. Why? Because I want to override my natural and your natural propensity to want to quit, to want to stop. It's natural. But I don't want to be natural. I want to be supernatural. I don't want to be ordinary. I want to be extraordinary. And that's that little extra. Does that make sense? So as you're training your brain, uh, as you have videos to watch to upgrade your knowledge and skills, as you have events to attend, you know, to, to connect, to, to listen, to learn, to expand, if you catch yourself thinking or feeling, I don't feel like it, I'm too tired, not today, tomorrow, that's the language, okay, that the brain uses, the rationalizations, the rational lies that your brain, my brain, everybody's brain uses to keep you in your comfort zone. Well, guess what? Everything you want financially, in your relationship health-wise is just outside your comfort zone and if you keep challenging and expanding your mental emotional physical spiritual financial comfort zones you expand as a human being and you start fulfilling more of your potential than standing on the edge of it hoping and praying and wishing that you can have greater better results is it possible to have a really great mindset yet still not achieve your goals and dreams? I think you know the answer is absolutely. There are so many people that are happy. They are positive. Uh, they're always the bubbly light in the room. And yet, many people with a great attitude and a mindset don't achieve their goals and dreams. And have you ever considered why? Have you ever considered that having a great attitude and being happy and being bubbly and, and always being positive may be a part of the formula for success, but not the entire formula for success. When I was learning how to achieve goals, not set goals, achieve goals, I learned three things that were required in order to make my goals a reality. And it doesn't matter if you have you know, goals for uh, spiritual connectivity and well-being, whether it's emotional stability and balance, whether it's mental focus and awareness, uh, or whether it's physical health and well-being. Mindset is what separates the rest from the best, or the best from the rest, any way that you want to look at it. But what is mindset? And maybe mindset's more than attitude. I think it is. So I look at mindset as the ability to lock in on a goal, to develop the skills required to achieve that goal, the ability to overcome obstacles that come in your way to achieve that goal, and to develop and implement a plan that's going to give you predictability for achieving the goal versus a possibility for achieving that goal. So what if part of your mindset was to think about the goal that you want, okay? And have the attitude that I'm gonna achieve it no matter what, and whatever comes into my way, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm gonna be persistent, I'm gonna be an adaptationist, I'm gonna go left, go right, go up, go down, go around, I'm gonna do everything possible to achieve that goal. But then the other part is, how specifically am I going to achieve that goal? Like, what are the strategies and the tactics? Meaning, what are you going to do? How specifically are you going to do it? By when? Right, so now, when we have, you know, an attitude uh, of goal achievement, of getting clear on the goal, coming up with what I'm going to do on Monday at 9 o'clock and here's how I'm going to do it and here's whose help I need. I'm going to put it right into my calendar and I'm going to take inspired action and when an obstacle comes in my way, I'm going to ask myself empowering questions like, how can I overcome this obstacle? What can I do 
to overcome this obstacle? Whose help do I need? What book can I read? What do I need to search on Google? What YouTube video can I watch to overcome this obstacle? Where can I learn better strategies and tactics to make what I do more efficient, more productive, more constructive versus me just working hard and long trying to do what to do? There's a formula called PPP equals PPP, and it goes like this. Piss poor planning equals piss poor performance. And many people, I have found, don't have any real plans for what they're gonna do today, this week, this month, this quarter. They show up every morning, okay, without a roadmap to go from where they are to where they wanna be by the end of the day. So what are you going to do today to achieve your health goals, your wealth goals, your relationship goals, your career goals, your business goals, your fun goals, the experiences you want, your charitable goals? What are you going to do today or this week to move yourself forward, to make progress every single day? And then what are you going to do to manage your mindset and your emotions? What are you going to do to overcome the obstacles that are in your area, whether they're mental obstacles, physical obstacles, financial obstacles, strategical obstacles, tactical obstacles? Now, you may be watching me right now going, oh my God, there's so much stuff there. Well, yeah, if you want to achieve goals, there's a thinking, there is a feeling, and there's a behavior that gets you there. And there's also a thinking, a feeling, and a behavior that does not get you there. Most people, you know, confuse activity with productivity. They confuse setting goals from achieving goals. They don't understand that you have to create some kind of a roadmap to reduce the resistance and uncertainty and stress and fear and anxiety in your brain so that you activate your motivational centers, the motive for action center in your brain so that you actually take action instead of repeating your old patterns over and over again. Achieving goals is a science. Setting goals is a, an exercise in imagination and hope and prayer of what you would like. So, mindset how you approach it, what you do, how you overcome obstacles, when you focus on how you will because you must, you start to achieve goals. The mindset of a winner is one of relentless pursuit until I achieve the goal. Crazy time in the world right now. So much uncertainty, unpredictability, chaos, confusion, lots of stuff that's happening right now that none of us have ever been a part of. Stuff like it, yeah, World War II, uh, some recessions, sure, but never anything like this with so many different competing uh, threats, so many different competing things to be thinking about that uh, affect your life every day, your business, your career, your family, your health, uh, lots of stuff going on. And the question I want you to be in, what are you going to do to make sure that your health is better than it is right now, that your finances are better than they are right now, that your relationship is better than it is right now, that your career or business is better than it is right now, and the reason I want you to focus on making it better is because where your attention goes, energy flows. Let me repeat, where your attention goes, energy flows. So if your attention is on, oh my God, what's happening? What am I gonna do about it? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I can't? What if I don't? What if I, listen, what if you do? What if you focus your energy and attention on how to make everything better right now? What will you do differently today, tomorrow, this week, next week? What will you do differently is what's gonna make the difference. More of the same equals more of the same. So I want you to recalibrate your focus, recalibrate your attention, recalibrate your intention, and then I want you to start some planning. Behavior equals results, and it's the behavior you take or the behavior you don't take. Either one is a behavior. You have more control than you think you do. You have more abilities than you think you do. And I know that with focused attention, 
and follow through, right? Follow through. You can have a great next 90 days. The question is, are you committed to a great next 90 days? I am looking for me, my team, uh, my private clients, you to finish the year off strong and to start next year fast and strong. And that's gonna take some thinking, some planning and execution. The discipline to follow through to completion. Are you in for the challenge? I'm here to support you. My team's here to support you. The tribe is here to support you. Together, we're gonna lift each other as we climb towards having an amazing next few months. In our brain, we're always balancing out whether to move forward or to retreat into safety. And so the reason we don't take action and we procrastinate and sabotage in a lot of cases is because our brain has processed that taking action is riskier than remaining the same. And here is something that your brain's always doing. It is analyzing, okay, your stories, reasons, excuses, and potential uncomfortable feelings or outcomes against the behavior that needs to be taken. And so it's easier for us to remain the same than it is for us to overcome our fears. It's easier for us to remain the same versus overcome our limiting beliefs. It's easier for us to remain the same versus challenging our self-esteem, self-worth stories and excuses. So when you have a big must, why you must achieve that goal, and when that must is bigger than your self-image, your stories, your excuses, or your fears, that is when you will take action. So you have to create leverage with your big must or musts. And so when you have your five big musts and you compare them against remaining the same or the fear of failure or the fear of being embarrassed, ashamed, ridiculed, or judged, when your must is bigger than those things, that's when you'll take inspired action. And you already know this if you followed my work, that we do more to avoid pain or discomfort, whether it's real or imagined. We do more to avoid pain or discomfort, real or imagined, than we will do to gain pleasure. So we have to create leverage in our mind. When someone is really having a hard life, hard time, they're in the situation that they don't want to like, I don't want to practice my inner side, I don't want to visualize what suggestion you have for them, you know, when they have the dark night of the soul? Well, listen, if you don't feel like doing something once in a while, then you're human. Okay. But like, let me know if this resonates with you and whoever's listening, let me know if it resonates with you. Do you agree with this statement? Mm -hmm. In life, you're gonna either pay the price of discipline or you're gonna pay the price of regret. Mm. Discipline weighs ounces, regret weighs tons. That's Jim Rohn, by the way. And so when you're sitting there and saying, I don't feel like it, yeah. my question for you is, what do you not feel like it more? Doing this little thing or living a life of regret? Wow, that's huge. <laughs> right, so let's create a juxtaposition against what I don't feel like doing. And let's use contrasting to say, are you okay with this being your character? Are you okay with this being your life forever? Are you okay with developing a lazy habit and lazy disciplines? Are you okay for the next one year, three years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40 years, having that as your modus operandi and your identity. If you're okay with that, great, don't feel like it, don't do it, but then don't complain and don't want any more. But if you're not okay with mm. the short-term and long-term consequences of that decision, then here's what I want you to say. I know I don't feel like it, but, I will do just a little bit. One of the things that I, that I really uh, learned many, many years ago was something around habits. And the habit is more important than the intensity. Yeah, the consistency. The habit, if you can get into 
doing something productive, constructive every day, every day, you will continue to do something pro your goals, pro your health, pro whatever it is every day. And some days uh, I have a trainer that comes to my home as well. And some days I'm exhausted. I've just exhausted. But I still go through the motions even when I'm exhausted. Yeah. Because the habit's more important to me than the intensity. So I, some days I feel like I don't want to work out. Right. I still do something. I don't care if I lay on the ground and my trainer moves my legs or my arms. I just move my neck left and right. I've still done right. something to create movement and to enforce or reinforce a positive habit that is part of the nucleus of success. Whenever I want to create anything, whether it's uh, my physical body, a home, a car, a trip, there's a big part of our brain called the occipital lobe, the back of our brain. Even when light comes in through our eyes, right, cells in the back of our brain activate and an image pops up in our brain. And that image that pops up into our brain is connected to the motivational center and the thinking center part of our brain. So if a negative image pops up, we reduce our motivation and we don't take action. And then we reinforce that pattern. But let's say I have a, an image of something that I really want, something that inspires me, that as soon as I pop up that image in my brain, I actually release dopamine yeah. Okay, uh, the reward neurochemical in my brain that actually creates motivation, that's actually tied to what I call as the Einstein part of the, part of the brain that can actually help you figure out how to achieve that thing. Mm. And so I create images of what is it that I want to create for health, wealth, relations, career, business, charity, fun and experiences so that I can activate the reward circuits in my brain, the motivational circuits in my brain, the thinking centers in my brain to help me figure out how to achieve it. But the other purpose of a vision board is to give your brain the instruction of, this is the stuff that's important to me that I wanna create, do, be, have, or give. Right. So, you know, we all have, you know, 50,000 thoughts a day. We all have so much on the social media, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or Clubhouse or whatever, all the different, you know, stations and channels are and the people that want to get, gather our attention. Well, why don't we become better at focusing our attention on what we want to trade our life for? Mm. Right. Because when somebody is pulling us to look at their stuff, like, <laughs> We're, yeah. we're, we're part of their goals and dreams and, and their vision versus me being focused on what is it that I want to trade my life for and instructing my brain, help me find ways to trade my life for these things. Mm. And that's how to use your brain properly um, versus your brain using you uh, yeah. because it may not have you know been conditioned properly with the right beliefs and focus and awareness and habits. And there are seven core emotions that people have. You know, happiness, sadness, fear, disgust, shame, guilt. Um, those are just emotions. And it's either something that's happening on the inside that's causing that emotion, something that you know, we associate with what we're doing, or something from the outside that's instigating that emotion. And so the first part of any change is to recognize the emotion that I'm feeling and not laying judgment on it, but accepting it as just energy in motion. It's either pleasant or unpleasant, something we want to move towards or move away from. So once we recognize it, the question then becomes, is it real? Is it true that I'm feeling this as a result of the meaning that I'm giving it? And in most cases, it's not true. It's something that we have become conditioned to believe is true because of the references or because of our own experiences that we have around that issue. And the way our brain works is anytime that we feel uncertain about something that may cause us harm or pain, a part of our brain called the reptilian brain actually activates in a billionth of a second a fear circuit which causes us to either flee, which means run away, freeze, which means we do nothing, or fight it, which means we're in most, in most cases fighting air. And so if we can reframe something, the meaning of it long enough to let the emotion pass, 
that causes the third R to be activated, and that's the release of an unpleasant emotion. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Tom Bilyeu, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. You must say fuck that noise. You cannot allow yourself to say that I'm too old ever again. I don't care if you're 98 and you know that you have 15 seconds left to live. Don't buy into the myth that you're too old because that is going to slow you down.